Welcome everybody. Hi, how are you today? Good. Yay. <laughs> My name is Sarah Colley. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Great Falls Public Library. We are so happy to have you all here and join us um, with Ken again uh, in this month. Um, the Great Falls Public Library is here to serve as a connection point to empower the community and enhance the quality of life by providing individuals access to information, social, and cultural and recreational resources. As always, we begin every program with um, some housekeeping. The bathrooms are out the door to the right, and the emergency exit is also out the door and to the right. Please do not take the elevator in the case of an emergency. Um, I am super excited to have you all here and to have Ken back at the library. Um, tonight, Ken will be uh, talking about little-known national achievements of several Great Falls High students who overcame the repressive racial environment in Great Falls and the nation of past years from, from such people as Wade Parker, um, who grew up here and became a prominent community organizer in Chicago. Um, Ken's going to be talking about a few other folks as well, and I will not steal the thunder. And please join me in welcoming Ken to the stage. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for coming. Does this sound good? Yes. Um, thanks for KGPR taking and uh, Care TV interviewing. And and the library, I think, also is recorded. So those of you who aren't here will have an opportunity. But I guess I'd say, begin by saying this was a really tough talk to put together because like every other aspect of uh, African-American history in our communities around Montana, when you tackle a subject, you do the, all the research. It's not there. It's not laid out in the history books, and, although we're getting a whole lot better about that. Um, when I originally wrote this, put the script together, it was uh, going to take at least two hours. I knew Sarah wouldn't put up with that since the library closes at 6 o'clock. <laughs> so Perry Knife went to work, and I uh, sure hated to shorten them, but I did. Edward and Elizabeth Sims were the first African Americans to settle in Great Falls in 1886. But until early in the 20th century, relatively few blacks entered Great Falls High School. And let me say up front, I'm not leaving Charlie Russell High School out. I just didn't begin until the 1960s, so please don't think I'm being unfair. By the time most of the black kids were of high school age, they were working and helping to support their families. And in fact, in the research I've done so far, and I'm not totally finished, but I believe two of the three that I'll talk about this evening are the first two black students to attend Great Falls High School, at least to stay for a couple of years. Until 1931, Great Falls High School was Central High School, and it's, of course, now Paris Gibson Square. Let me begin, though, with the first of the two African-American students at Central High School, Alexander Wilford Robinson. This is Wilford in 1917. His parents, John Wesley and Isabel Pettifer Robinson, arrived in Great Falls about 1890, so very soon after <coughs> our, little, uh, our little town began in 1884, and they married here. Their first child, Maddie Kastner Robinson, which is an interesting name since she clearly was Maddie, this Maddie was clearly named after Maddie Kastner, the mother of Belt, who was an African American lady. And the year after uh, Maddie was born in 1890, the year after Wilford was born in 92, uh, the Methodist Church in Great Falls, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Great Falls, the original one at today's location, of course, it's a, it's a brick facade church that was opened in uh, 1917, but this one was opened in 1891, and this little church was the heart and soul of the black community on the Lower South Side until that new church replaced it. Wilfred went by many names, and this was tough on my research, 
Alexander, Wilford, Willie, Alex, A.W., and I've just discovered last night, Wilf, Will Burr, so searching was uh, really complicated. During his youth, though, he was Willie, and when he was just five years old, his mother deserted the family and the two small children. His father divorced her two years later and remarried Lila Johnson Smith. The Robinson family then settled into a busy and seemingly stable life. Father John owned and operated a small express and transport company and was active in the colored Masonic Lodge and the Republican Party. While Lado and the children combined school and active participation in Union Bethel church and social activities, when Union Bethel had concerts, Willie would discover or uh, deliver a recitation while his sister and mother would provide solos and duets. Typical of their social life in 1906, Willie and Maddie joined with 30 other young friends on the Lower South Side at a Martha Washington party for games and dancing. A Hindu fortune teller was present and sandwiches, cocoa, ice cream, and dancing were the, were the thing. Martha Washington parties were a fad and apparently it was, be, it was because uh, President Washington's first lady was an elegant and frequent entertainer, so it became kind of a fad in social circles in the early 1900s. Willie, then known as Wilford, entered Griffiths High School in the fall of 1907. He was an excellent student and continued there through his junior year when he entered Wilberforce University in the fall of 1910. So his first three years at Great Falls High, but then he left to attend a college. Wilberforce is the nation's oldest private historically black university owned and operated by African Americans. Its roots tra trace back to 1856 as a bold and visionary example of transcending race and the prevailing social and cultural norms to pursue a noble purpose. Wilberforce University was named for the great 18th century abolitionist William Wilberforce who said, quote, we are too young to realize that certain things are impossible so we'll do them anyway, unquote. At Wilberforce, <coughs> Wilford excelled. He completed his preparatory work and received his Bachelor of Science degree, cum laude, normally a three-year course in three years, graduating the class of 1913. During his years at Wilberforce, he was elected president of his senior class and earned other honors as captain of the football team for 1911-12, president of the athletic association all three years he was there, and captain of the track team 1912-13. Impressive record. After graduation from Wilberforce, Wilford left school for a year until 1915 when he entered the University of Chicago to complete two terms to pre prepare himself in chemistry for the medical course at Howard University. Wilbur, Wilbur, Wilford entered Howard, the famed black university in the District of Columbus, named for the Christian general Oliver Lowell Howard of Civil War fame. Wilford graduated in the upper half of his class in 1918, completing his medical doctor's degree. While at Howard, Wilford was secretary of the Surgical League and his rank at graduation marked him as a strong student. Over the years, Wilford worked for his father, John, in Great Falls whenever he was not in school, handling and hauling garbage and tasks like that as a tra small transport company. In addition to what he was able to earn in that way during the summer, his father helped him pay the way through school. Dr. A. Wilford Robinson, as he was known after graduation, was interviewed on his return to Great Falls, and we don't have time for the long interview that blessed the Tribune, they printed it. But he said, 
now that it's over, he believes it's the best thing for him because it makes him appreciate to the full the value of the opportunity that, aided by his ever-loved, par loyal parents, he was able to forge for himself the fact that he possibly stands as the first colored man from Montana to graduate from a professional school. If you've noticed the timing, you'll recognize that by 1917, the U.S. was at war, the Great War, as it was then known. Wilford registered for the national draft in Great Falls. We learned much about World War, from World War I draft cards, name, current residence, date and place of birth, married or single, and a brief physical description. And in Wilford's case, we learned also the intriguing fact that he'd already served two years as a private in the infantry in Montana. Now, how he did that is a real mystery since blacks could not serve with the Montana Guard, and I don't know how else he would have served. And maybe it, I mean, it's there on the record, so who knows? He also, at that time, claimed an exemption as a student, and this was in 1917 when he registered, so it was a year from graduation. He claimed exemption as a student at the medical department at Howard. On November 19th, 1917, Wilford enlisted in the medical corps, and this was, of course, while he was still at Howard. And once he re received his medical degree, he was called up assigned to the 343rd Service Battalion, Dr. Robinson was not allowed to serve as a doctor or an officer, but was appointed a corporal, at least he didn't have to enter as a private, serving as a medical corpsman. His battalion reported to Camp Alexander at Newport News, Virginia. That camp quartered black labor and service battalions and was named for 2nd Lieutenant John Hawks Alexander, the <coughs> graduated from West Point in 1887, the second black to so graduate. He served with the 9th Cavalry on the frontier, very likely in Montana Territory, and then became a professor of military science at Wilberforce University. Don't know whether he was there when uh, Wilford went through. Corporal Robinson and his small 15-man unit boarded a transport ship on October 7th, 1918, deploying to France just a month before the armistice that brought that brutal war to an end. Many American troops remained in France and Germany for many months after the armistice in November, and eight months later, on July 10th, 1919, the 343rd Service Battalion boarded the USS Decalbe Nazaire of France to return to the U.S. Corporal Robinson was discharged in July 1919 at St. Louis after serving nine months in France. The details of what Corporal Robinson and his medical department service battalion exactly did remain elusive, although I've seen some reference to dental work, so I, I really haven't been able to pin it down. Returning to Great Falls, Wilford joined in the family business. John W. Robinson and Son came at that point and resided with the family of 1111 Sixth Avenue South. In February 1920, Union Bethel celebrated the birth of the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, with a program that included Wilford reading the preliminary proclamation of, uh, of emancipation. And they also had a program with many patriotic songs like Battle Hymn of the Republic and Star Spangled Banner. In 1920, sister Maddie and her husband, James R. Chase, moved to Seattle. His parents, John W. and Lada, moved the year after with Wilford and Company. Although he was known as Doc Robinson for most of his time in Seattle, he apparently never practiced medicine his obituary in Seattle's black newspaper, the Northwest Enterprise, reported that he'd worked in Seattle 24 years in exclusive hotels and men's clubs. Mother Leda died there in 1926. Maddie and James Chase and Doc Robinson were prominent in Seattle's
colored social circle. In May 1927, Dr. Robinson entertained at dinner in a private dining room of Mrs. Art Smith's cafe. The occasion was the impending departure of his father and James Chase on the SS HF Alexander for a cruise to Los Angeles. The Chases and Wilford often made the society pages of the Northwest Enterprise, managed by uh, John Robinson, his father's brother, so it was uh, Wilford's uncle, E.I. Robinson, that uh, operated this Northwest Enterprise newspaper. And uh, it recorded uh, many of the social events, like a January 1928 affair, one of the most one of the elaborate affairs given this season was a night in Monte Carlo, given Saturday evening at the home of Mr. and Mrs. James R. Chase by the midnight troubadours. The home was beautifully decorated for the occasion. Guests upon entering were presented with 10 pennies with which they were invited to try their luck at different games offered for their amusement. Dancing was also enjoyed during the evening and a buffet was served in the attractive breakfast room. About 80 guests attended the affair. Among the three hosts was Dr. Robinson. Wilford was married there to Helen B. Uh, P. Black in August 1928, although the marriage ended in divorce several years later. He later remarried. Wilford Robinson died in Seattle in October 1943 and is interred in Veterans Memorial Cemetery, Argonne Forest section at Evergreen Washili Memorial Park in Seattle. His funeral drew detailed reporting under the headline, Impressive Rites, Warm Passing of Doc Robinson. Many of, and it said, many of both races witnessed the last rites for Doc Wilbur Robinson yesterday. Saturday. If the large uh, floral decorations surrounding the body of the many clinging to the walls of the funeral <coughs> parlor could speak, they would have told of the kindly feeling in which he's held. And it goes on with this uh, very, very eloquent uh, funeral. The bugler heralded their coming, a veteran is being honored today. Following the cemetery, uh, the officer of the day, A.R. Baker, deftly folded the American flag, draping the casket, and handed it to the weeping wife. Keep, it, keep this in remembrance of him. If you are ever troubled, don't fail to call us. Ladies of the LF artillery shared the solo of their comrades. Three, uh, three volleys were heard from the firing squad, the bugle sounded, bugle sounded taps, the mourners, tears in their eyes, turned their faces homeward, and Doc Robinson journeyed down the Lonesome Road. Good reporting in that Northwest Enterprise nice. newspaper. Our second Mary Falls High School student comes almost a half century later. Wade Parker was a classmate of mine in the class of 1955 at Mary Falls High, and we shared the same home room. In the past couple of decades, I've gotten to know, I've gotten together with Wade and the Parker family in person and by phone many times. Here, Wade is seated at the far right during a reunion with friends at Ryan Dam about uh, 13 years ago, I think. No, it wasn't that long ago. Anyway, as students and throughout their lives, the Parkers are a most remarkable family. Wade and his sister Ruth, one year ahead in school, are two of seven siblings born to be, or Beatrice, and Agnes Mary Williams Parker. Agnes was born in 1908 to an early black family in Red Falls, while Bee came here from Jackson County, Missouri. Their children, Jane and Dorothy, whose father was actually Herbert Novotny, who was tragically killed in a forest fire on the Rocky Mountain front at uh, Waldron Creek, um, and uh, Agnes then remarried B and had the other children, Ruth, Wade, Phyllis, Stephen, and Alice. They were raised on the lower south side at 618 4th Avenue in, on the south side. 
The Parker Family Home stood as a place of welcome for members of the local African-American community and for those traveling through. They were pillars in Union Bethel Church. Ruth Parker McClendon attended the University of Montana after Great Falls High and later moved to California where she was a teacher in the California high school system remarkably for many, many years until recently, most summers, Ruth would drive her RV up to Great Falls, park it in Dick's RV Park on the west side and spend the summers based in Great Falls visiting old friends and classmates. Brother Stephen passed on and then younger sister Alice and the Parker family returned to Great Falls for their interment in Manchester Cemetery and gatherings with friends like that picnic photo there. I was honored to join them on <coughs> special occasions. We blazed through public, the public school system, strong in athletics and music, and surrounded by a large circle of white friends. We talked fondly of the dozen or so uh, athlete friends who were with him through all of his school years. He was a member of the Boy Scout Oaths, Troop 10, Mohawk Patrol and served as assistant scoutmaster in 1952. He joined 148 of us from north central Montana, the only black scout from here, to attend the 1953 National Boy Scout Jamboree at Irvine Ranch in California. In high school, charismatic Wade was active in music and sports, the Booster Club, and one very popular student. He was elected vice president of our junior class and president of our senior class. In Great Falls schools, the discrimination that pervaded the rest of Great Falls community was just not there. Yet when Wade or Ruth would walk out of the doors of Great Falls High, they faced the same discrimination as the rest of the black community. They could not join unions, so they were shut out of the best paying jobs. They could join their father and other black men and women in service jobs, serving as porters in hotels and janitors in banks and museums. When of age, they could not spend an evening at the jockey club or the rest of the restaurants and nightclubs in downtown Great Falls. Yet Wade was an achiever not to be held back. He was welcomed in scouts and, and in the then prominent YMCA in Great Falls. Wade became close to the executive director Upshaw of the Y and, and became active in Y summer camps, named best counselor for three consecutive years during high school. The only Great Falls counselor at that point ever so named for three years in a row. Upon up, Upshaw's encouragement, Wayne at, Wade attended George Williams College in Chicago George Williams had its genesis in a summer camp founded on the shores of Geneva Lake in Wisconsin by YMCA leaders in 1886. This camp was created to serve as a professional YMCA training school and it moved to Hyde Park, a Chicago suburb in 1890 where it transformed to a college. At George Williams, Wade excelled academically and in sports as her basketball team center, and there's Parker scoring, I think, 17 points, and a key player on offense. Wade graduated with a BS degree in group work education in George Williams' 70th commencement and went directly to work as a director of the Chicago Boys Club. Over the next several decades, over the next several decades, Wade Parker served Chicago communities moving for higher and higher positions, always centered on youth and community development. He married and had two children. The Chicago Tribune filled his, filled, was filled with his advancements and activities. In 1969, Chicago city government created a new Department of Human Resources and Wade was hired to fill a top position as Director of Youth Services. That same year, we get a measure of his brilliant success when the JCs of Chicago 
a city of three and a half million people at that point, honored 10 top young men in the cities, including Reverend Jesse Jackson, Chicago Bear star, Gail Sayers, and Wade Parker. And just for context, I, I mentioned that Chicago had 3.6 million, 58% white, 32% black. Through the 1970s, Wade held positions like Director of Field Operations of Model Cities, Chicago Committee on Urban Opportunity, say that quickly, leading the first group of minority teenagers from the U.S. on a two-week tour of China after Nixon-Kissinger-thawed relations. After many years and honors for his work in Chicago youth activities and later as a leader in Illinois, child welfare, foster, and foster care services. Wade moved into the financial industry. He served as the executive vice president of Common Home Federal Savings and Loan Association, managing uh, Illinois' largest network of uh, savings and loan offices. All the while, he continued his leadership in youth programs such as chairman of the South Shore YMCA, a board member of the National YMCA, and chairman of the Chicago Youth Center, a nonprofit designed to help inner city youth. It's hard to imagine any one person who, has, who did more for inner city youth than 1955 graduate Wade Parker. Today, Wade and his wife enjoy retirement in Henderson, a suburb of Las Vegas. Wade, we salute you for your exemplary life and your immense contributions to our nation's youth. Moving quickly on to our third Great Falls High student, Jess Lee Brooks, or Jesse as he was known in Great Falls. We return to the early 1900s. Jess Lee was born in Jefferson County on the plains of the Texas Gulf Coast in southeast Texas in June 19, uh, 1893 with Mother Virgil Mary Brooks. They moved to Great Falls before 1904. I've been unable to identify his father. I don't know what happened along the way. In June 1906, Virgil Mary and Wilford's father, John Robinson, were both on the program for Children's Day at Union Bethel and in 1907, Jesse Brooks, as well as Wilfred Robinson, joined 148 other boys and girls entering Great Falls High School. The next year, Virgil Mary married Charles Edward Bigby, a member of the large Bigby family that moved to, to Great Falls from Tennessee in the 1890s. That marriage was short-lived, ending in divorce in 19. The city director in 1908 has Jesse Brooks working as a shoe shiner at Ed Sims Electric City Shoe Shine Parlor while he was attending high school. Now, I don't know who these individuals are except Ed Sims is seated there. He, he managed that shoe shine parlor. The black community celebrated Lincoln's birthday in 1909, and Jesse Brooks sang a solo that evening. In May, he rendered a reading of How John Finn's Fireman Saved a Boy at the Star and Crescent Literary Society in Great Falls High School. The next January, at uh, the 47th day, of 47th Emancipation Day at Union Bethel in the presence of white guests and speakers including Methodist minister Brother Van and city leaders. 14-year-old Jesse stole the show with his major address called Opportunities for Young Negro Men in the West. And thanks to the Tribune, we have his whole address. I can only give you a few words in the uh, for time. This is part of the two two hour version. <laughs> Here is just the, the brief few words I mentioned. The study of this question has often proved both a comfort and an inspiration to me. 
what our race needs is men, manly men, men who will not be daunted by the stings of venom or the arrows of slander. Are not our young men able to do this? When our young men finish their education in the West, they move East with the excuse that there's nothing for them to apply themselves to in the West. And he goes on. In June 1909, Great Falls High School Roundup, then a journal rather than the an annual that it later became, published a most remarkable <coughs> article by young Jesse Brooks entitled, The Advantage of Disadvantages. It was, it was just a brilliant piece. And he wrote, among other things, you who are not of my race at all times remember that our fathers, fresh from slavery, pressed forward in spite of their ignorance, discouragements, and lack of skill. They crowded every available schoolhouse with children, and by labor, unskilled though it was, made the valleys bloom as the rose, and the little hilltops clap their hands for joy. Wow. <laughs> Were we not born to do a greater task? One year later, in April 1910, the Roundup printed a second article by young Jesse, entitled, The Race Problem in the West. Jesse's article was reprinted in the Helena Block newspaper, The Montana Plain Dealer. The editor, Joseph Bass, was a family friend and an avowed supporter of uh, Booker T. Washington's social ideology. He commended young Brooks for his insights and promise. In the fall of 1910, Jesse, like Wilford, left Great Falls High at the end of his junior year, in this case, to enter Western University at Quintard, Kansas, near Kansas City. Jesse joined Editor Bass's own daughter at Western, an all-black industrial school modeled after Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. And I'll emphasize that Western was famous for his musical program. Six months later, Jesse wrote to Editor Bass about his experiences at Western. And fortunately, the plain dealer published this. Dear friend, I'm clearly in love with Western University and has done so much for me since I've been here. And I've learned so many good things, come in contact with so many great and good people that has entirely changed my life. I feel, Mr. Bass, that I owe all of this to you and my dear mother, and I'm trying and will keep striving with all that's in me to obtain all there is in my opportunity and in, in the end show you that your efforts to better my condition and help me on to the higher things was not in vain. Since I've been here, I've been the leader of my class and was recently elected president of the James A. Handy Literary Society, and your daughter was elected secretary. I name these things only to show you that I'm striving to go upward to the highest pinnacle, and I'm succeeding, and this adds to my chance for better and higher things. I attended the funeral of the late Bishop Grant, and it was one of the greatest occasions I've ever witnessed. All of the bishops of the church were there together at this AMA church. With such distinguished men as Booker T. Washington. As I sat in my seat and listened and watched the ceremonies with awe and astonishment, I thought of how proud I ought to be because I was a Negro. I thought of what opportunities and encouragement our boys and girls out west are missing because they're not in the midst of the great Negroes, so they might not be inspired by their presence. Remember I mentioned earlier that Jesse and Wilford were in a class of 148 students entering Great Falls High in 1907. Well, in the spring of 1911, only 44 of those 148 graduated. And that was typical, about 35% would graduate from high school. So it wasn't just black students that had problems um, completing high school or even attending high school. Jesse graduated from Western in 1914 and then attended the famed Northwestern School of Drama, where he studied, studied under the best dramatic and vocal teachers. 
justly as he was then known, that was his birth name, moved to the West Coast where he married Georgia M. Colshot in Los Angeles in September 1914. He joined the nation's young men and re registered for the World War I draft, draft in 1917 in Seattle, reporting his employment as table waiter at the Butler Hotel, married with one child. At times, circumstances forced Jer uh, Jeff to turn to cooking, waiting tables, odd jobs, cheaper cabaret work for a living. Yet he was an immensely capable young man. In October 1921, he took a civil service commission examination that included criminal law and police practice and procedures and ranked second out of a class of 30 applicants. <coughs> Jesse was then named a police officer in Tacoma, Washington, possibly the first black so named. In August 1924, Jess remarried Mrs. Rita Catherine Simpson Duran of Portland, a fine pianist who became a regular accompanist for Jess Lee in his budding musical career. Sometime by the mid-1920s, Jess Lee began actively performing in concerts in AME and other black churches. It's not clear when he left the police force, but in March 1929, a Tacoma newspaper reported Jess Lee Brooks Colored, a former member of the type of Tacoma police force, was stabbed three times following a quarrel at a card game in the Milwaukee club. From 1930 on, Jess Lee's fame as a baritone skyrocketed along the West Coast, from California to Washington. At AME and other black and white churches, Jess was featured, quote, from Hollywood as a bass, baritone, and dramatic reader with a deluxe program of classics, Negro spirituals, popular selections, and dramatic readings. His wife, Rita Catherine Brooks, is his ranger and accompanist and contralto and pianist. The Portland Oregonian raved about his performance at the Corvallis Presbyterian White Church. Mr. Brooks comes with the national reputation and with the highest praise from many critics of note throughout the nation. Mr. Brooks simply thrilled the audience at my church with his stirring interpretation of the Negro spiritual. His reputation continued to grow. A prominent citizen of Portland declared, Mr. Brooks is the West's foremost contribution to the concert stage. His rendition of Old Man River is the greatest interpretation of a Negro song that I've ever heard. In 1932, after another performance in Seattle, Critics reported the recital by Mr. Brooks, assisted by his wife, Rita Catherine Brooks, was a revelation. They presented one of the finest and most ex effective recitals ever heard in Seattle. Mr. Brooks, as a bass singer, displayed an art of considerable proportion, an art which entitles him to a high ranking among local artists, local artists of America. During the early 1930s, Jess Lee became one of the first members of the Negro unit of the Federal Theater Project. The Federal Theater Project was a program under the New Deal to fund live artistic performances. The Negro Theater Project set up in 23 cities from 1935 to 1939, provided much needed employment and apprenticeships to hundreds of black actors, directors, theater technicians, and playwrights. This began Jess Lee's career in the theater. His performance as Emperor Henri Christophe in Black Empire at the Mayan Theater in Los Angeles drew rave reviews. The California Eagle reported, if the first night showing in the favorable reaction of the large crowd of first-nighters gathered at the Mayan Theater Monday night to witness the Western premiere of the historical drama of Haiti's Black Empire, then of course its success, future success is assured. The co-authors Christine Ames and Charles Painter have confidently placed their full responsibility of enacting the living role of their historical effort upon the broad 
shoulders of Jeff Lee Brooks, who played the title role. Brooks was a complete surprise to the vast number of white people in the audience. His acting was superb. The flawless manner he relived the life of the Haitian monarch was most inspiring and played a definite part in the success of this masterful piece. Jess Lee was acclaimed by critics and public alike as being among the outstanding dramatic performances of 1936. Black Empire played the capacity houses of the Mayan in downtown Los Angeles, the Hollywood Playhouse, and the Greek Theater. Moving on, Jess Lee broke more new ground for black actors. For the first time in the history of American theater, a black actor was selected to play the role of the Prince of Morocco in Shakespeare's immortal Merchant of Venice. The famous classic was staged at the Hollywood Playhouse by the Federal Theater Project with Jess Lee Brooks playing the Moroccan Prince. The opening drew rave reviews with headlines like Jess Brooks scores in Shakespeare role. In 1938, Jess played the character of Reverend Jones, a Baptist Negro preacher in Rain Little Children, Run Little Children, Hall Brown's folk drama with music and an all-colored cast opened at the Mayan Theater. Ed Sullivan's Looking at Hollywood column raved, Run Little Children, it seems to this observer, is one of the outstanding plays brought to the American theater and distinguished by so many fine individual performances it's difficult to dwell over long on any one. Run the Little Children is sheer stage magic. As the 1930s unfolded, Jesse Lee balanced his musical performances and theater careers with movie films. In 1937, he made his film de debut in Dark Manhattan. In March 1940, film critic Earl J. Morris raved, Mystery in Swing is the best all-colored cast picture I've ever seen, and believe me, I've seen practically all of them, whether produced by Black Hollywood or in Harlem. Just Lee Brooks was great. Jesse Brooks was an exceptional actor. He appeared in many of the top black cinema movies of the time. About two dozen of them I've identified. Always playing the role of the caring policeman trying to warn the gangsters before it's too late, or a father who who died for his kids. Whatever he played, he was always a guardian angel over ones he cared for. The only time he'd do anything wrong was if you wronged him or a loved one. Movie audiences felt as though they knew him when seeing him off screen because on screen his natural love, kind word for all, and protective persona reminded them of their father. Even in Hollywood films, he, was, he often outshone many of the white leading stars with his strong presence like in Sullivan's travels where he gave an emotional performance that no one will forever forget after seeing it. Brooks died in 1944 and gained respectful of his words. Let's turn now to, to the, <coughs> the great film, uh, Sullivan's Travels, and end with Jesse Brooks. He began it all at Great Falls High and his memorable performance in this movie of the spiritual Go Down Moses. This immortal performance is one that I'll never forget. Let me begin with the striking legacy of that movie, Sullivan's Travels. In 1990, it was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. In 2006, the American Film Institute listed Sullivan's Travels as number 25 on their top 100 films of all time. Well, actually, they called it the AFI 100 Years, 100 Laughs. 
the Writers Guild of America voted the screenplay for uh, Sullivan's Travels as the 29th greatest Attention ever written. Attention library patrons. The time is 5.45 and the library closes in 15 minutes. If you have a screen, check out. As well as the 35th finest. Now let me explain. Now let, let, let me explain this one Jess Lee's great spiritual through a lengthy quote from a blog called The Impact on Jess Lee Brooks on the website Preserve Old Broadway. Quote, in my opinion, the Negro spiritual sprang from the hearts and souls of slaves and former slaves who sought a spiritual refuge where truth and justice were universal and where salvation lay in the mind of the individual. Love became the universal solvent to dissolve the frustration of human injustice. The slave could only endure slavery if he or she focused on love as the pinnacle of thought. We're going to provide you with a short video clip from the movie Sullivan Travels, a Preston Surges movie that was released in December 1941. It's a combination of satire and dramatic reality. It resolves around a Hollywood director, played by Joel McRae, who wants to direct the great American tragedy. In order to direct such a picture, John L. Sullivan, the fictional director, sets out on a journey across America to learn about the pain being experienced throughout the country. He gets more than he bargained for. Disguised as a hobo and wrongly accused of murder, murder Sullivan was sent to, a work, to work on a chain gang in the South. The brutal existence is relieved every so often when prisoners are well behaved. They get a chance to see a movie. Because no movie theater will, sh will show uh, films to prisoners. They're forced to view the movie from the pews of a black church situated in the backwoods. Our video clip starts with an in the interior shot of the church and an explanation being provided by its preacher, played to perfection by Just Lee Brooks. Listen to the, germane, uh, the genuine humility of the preacher as he prepares the first three rows of the church for the prisoners. Neither by word, nor by action, nor by look should we make our guests feel unwelcome, he says. For we are all equal in the sight of God. We usually enter a church while a hymn is being played on a church organ. In this case, the preacher suggests that they welcome their guests through song. It's in this way to let the Prisoners enter and carry with them some shreds of their lingering dignity. Now let's give our guests a little welcome. And they break into a magnificent rendition of Go Down Moses, led by the preacher's solo. In the second verse, we can now hear the clank of the chains, synchronized to the sound of the spiritual. The movie was a, unable to provide a lengthy dissertation on Negro spirituals, so it forces the audience to make all the important associations. It uses metaphorically large themes, repeated place, time, and situation to build momentum and use the deep rumbling bass and baritone harmonic overtures, overtones to protect to penetrate our outer being and enter into our inner soul. Go down Moses starts by using the line, when Israel was in Egypt land. The use of this line forces us to compare the Jews held in captivity in Egypt and the former slaves. Now poor black residents living under the tyranny of Jim Crow South. However, it also forces us to associate the words with the chained convicts now entering the church. The choral response is, let my people go. The next solo line, oppressed so hard they could not stand, 
gives us a clear reference to all form of enslavement, even though the lines describe only the Jews <coughs> in Egypt. Again, the choral response, let my people go. The reiteration reinforces the need for freedom and the fairness for all. Now in unison, the lead and chorus sing Go Down Moses, which gives us the first biblical reference to Moses as the man leading his people out of Egypt, out of captivity to the promised land. The next line, way down in Egypt land, but it could have been restated, way down in the land of God. We hear Moses tell old Pharaoh, Pharaoh, in, to let my people go, but we never hear about the parting in the Red Sea. We don't need to hear about the rescue across dry land because we know it happened. We don't need to hear about the pillar by day or the fire by night because we know it happened. We don't need to hear how Moses smote the rock and water poured forth because we know both the rock and the water are part of the story. Jesse Lee Brooks, AKA Jesse Brooks, was an exceptional actor. Movie audience, audiences felt as though they knew him and loved him. So I've seen the movie many times. I forget how much, even though it was a fine cast and a great director in Preston Sturgis. However, what I will never forget and will always keep close to my soul is this one segment of the movie, whenever I hope to be, whatever I hope to leave as my legacy, I only hope and pray that it's half as good as what Jess Lee Brooks has left us. So let's go on with the show.
will be closing in five minutes at six o'clock. Please gather your belongings and head to the nearest exit. Again, the library will be closing in five minutes at six o'clock. Thank you very much. I think Sarah's going to put us out. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you.